welcome to another irregular seminar on the Friday. Thank you for coming, Stefan. Uh, Stefan Felder is associate professor at University of New South Wales in Sydney, in Australia, and he has been visiting, visiting us for his sabbatical since I think you know him already since um, August, I think, mid August. Uh, just a bit a brief description. So, uh, Stefan is actually German. He did his diploma, in, in engineering diploma in Aachen two years ago, and then he moved to Australia for a PhD in Queensland, where after he stayed as a professor, now an associate professor in, in, in New South Wales. Um, so, to forget, you are now deputy director of the Water Research Laboratory in the university, and the work of Stefan uh, has been in hydraulic engineering, applied fluid mechanics. Air water flows, more air water flows, hydraulic structures, and also, also fish passage, fish in, in the rivers. Uh, Stephanie is here sponsored by International Excellent um, uh, Fellowship of so KIT, so that, that's, that's a good thing to know. And he has been developing also research with, with us, with Danielle, me, and Frank Seidel as well. And I think well, it's also an interesting uh, conjecture to be together here. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for being. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for providing the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so it's not just a seminar for, for this institute or of this institute, it's also the 21st International Excellence Talk of ART. Um, and so PLT, I've been asked to put a couple of slides in on, on these international excellence grants of ART. So they've got a scheme that they uh, put up. Uh, up to 2026, where they have different initiatives to uh, strengthen KRT's global outreach and replication. And one of these schemes is the, is the International Excellence Fellowship Scheme, and I've been fortunate enough to um, yeah, come here and visit as part of this scheme, uh, yeah, spending here uh, from August till December this year. If you need to know or want to know more about this, contact Eleanor Pfeiffer. Please um, contact me. Mm -hmm. All right. So I would like to do first some uh, yeah some acknowledgements. So obviously to KIT for awarding this International Excellence Fellowship. So they, they could come in the first place, and then to um, IWG, in particular mention to Daniel Valero and Mario Franca for um, hosting me, but also more generally to all of A IWG team for uh, welcoming me to the lab. And then more specific to the talk, so what I'm going to talk about, um, I would like to also thank colleagues, collaborators, former PhD students uh, who have contributed to the particular research that I'm going to present um, in these slides. So to name Benjamin Hormuth, Matthias Kramer, Daniel Valero, and former PhD students Laura Montagnier and Bradley. But there are others and um, so where am I coming from? So originally from Germany, as Mario mentioned, but I'm actually in Sydney these days. Uh, it's on the other side of the world. Australia is quite big. And so Sydney is this little dot here. And this is Sydney. About 5.3 million people live in Sydney. Um, it's pretty big. So it's here from the coastline to the Blue Mountains. It's about 65 kilometers in, in distance. The CBD and the Opera House, etc., is all pretty close to the coastline. So it's a bit of a challenge because the geographic center is actually here in Parramatta. So there's all kinds of issues, etc. But it's very nice along the coastline. Um, here's where my university is based, where I do the teaching. But my research actually happens at the UNSW Water Research Laboratory, which is at the northern beaches. And we are positioned just downstream of a large dam. And I use this photo as an intro to what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So there will be a lot of dams, hydraulic structures, features, etc. in this presentation. Ivanhoe Dam is Queensland's most important piece of public infrastructure and its most dangerous. In good times, it captures water for Greater Brisbane to drink, and in bad times, mitigates floods. At the height of last summer's flood crisis, it became so full that operators' only consideration was the safety of the dam. If it failed, it would be an almost unimaginable disaster, putting at risk an estimated 244,000 people. Right, this little intro video sets the scene for my talk. So it's all about 
large hydraulic structures, speak dams, and I will touch on quite a few of the features mentioned in this presentation. So it's really about large structures, which provide really good things to society, but if it rains or flood occurs, they're actually very critical infrastructure which should never fail. So just touching briefly on, on those aspects, so what are the functions? Um, obviously they store water of the stream or river, We've got about 65,000 large dams around the world. So large dams means about 50 meters in height. So there are many, many more smaller scale dams or other uh, barriers. Um, several functions, including flood mitigation, so water resource uh, yeah, um, control. Uh, they provide drinking water for society. They have irrigation and industrial uses. Hydroelectricity is important, and including uh, pump storage, hydroelectricity capacity, and recreational use. In this talk, I will talk uh, from a positive side of dams, but I acknowledge that there are also detrimental environmental effects. So they've got negative impacts on society and environment, and so these should be minimized. And it's a critical role of engineers, not only to think about like, um, yeah, building new ones or making the existing ones safe, but also thinking about like, could we remove some of the dams which are no longer used? So I'm just um, flagging that I'm very well aware that this is not a one-sided uh, situation when we talk about dams. If we've got dams, any existing dam or the new dam that uh, is planned, it's paramount that the dam must be set. There is no question about this. Any failure of the dam would be a catastrophe. And I'm pointing to three cases here, which occurred uh, not that long ago, of cases, not necessarily failures, but showing that this can happen around the world. So Oroville Dam in the US in 2017 was a wake up call for quite a few people around the world, the dam community, because the spillway uh, failed. So the spillway, you can see here the water discharging from the dam, and here the unusual flow patterns. So a concrete slab what was ripped up, and once you've got a small failure, the water has enormous force to actually um, cause some massive destruction. So this was repaired afterwards with about a billion US dollars. There was a second problem here, the auxiliary spillway it was actually not functioning and was almost uh, close to um, yeah, basically failing completely. Another example close to here is Steinbachtal Dam in Germany in 2021. I don't think it got much attention, but what basically happens, the flood release facility failed and water overtopped this dam. And you can see here the erosion to the embankment. Nothing bad happened because they, they pumped very quickly water out of the dam and they were lucky that not more water came at that point in time, but it could have failed very easily. And this happened this year in Libya, 2023. Uh, you've probably heard about the dam failures there upstream of Dana, with thousands of people dying and many more thousands still missing. So these things are quite uh, acute and have never gone away. There have been always dam failures over the years, so it's actually a problem. This problem could increase in future. Uh, we've got two issues here. One is that we've got many aging dams. So if we build the dam, we obviously need to maintain it. And the lifetime of the dam might be 50 years. Many dams being built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But there is enormous cost and expertise required to keep them up to date continuously. And the other issue we have is obviously climate change. We know we've got more intense rain events, which can lead to more intense flood events. So all this puts extra strain on the resources we have. So there's no question that safety should be paramount. I always compare it to a nuclear power plant. A nuclear power plant should not uh, yeah, have any problems. A dam should not have any problems either, because um, as in the video shown, if Vibonor Dam upstream of Brisbane would have failed, there would have been 244,000 people just in the floodway coming up. So my talk will be touching a bit on a question uh, what is the current design approach? What's the current instrumentation we have? And also the question, uh, is our current design appropriate? Um, as a statement here, obviously we should always use the best possible approach. And when I talk about we, I'm having a hydraulics head on, 
There are many other disciplines involved around dams, structures, geotech, just name some. The interesting thing is a key feature of all those failures or the risk of failures, it's actually the water when we get the floods when the failure occurs. The failure might not be due to the hydraulics people doing any design flaws, but it's the interaction with soil or concrete and the structure itself. So the hydraulics is actually a fundamental mechanism for any potential failure of the dam. So if we look across the flows, and this is just the spilling uh, dam, it's, it's nothing major, it's just uh, yeah, a very simple dam. We see aerated flows here getting into a stilling basin. Uh, where the energy needs to be dissipated. If we've got flood events, it's a lot of energy, enormous amounts of energy that needs to be dissipated at exactly that point. Typically, we use hydraulic jumps, which uh, are other types, but it's very intense motions, very violent flows, etc. These flows, linked with this violent nature of the flow and the energy situation, are also very, very complex, and they're typically aerated. So it's not a trivial thing to do. So once we have flooding, it's actually a challenge. And some dams might not spill for a decade. And then at that point, they actually need to safely operate and dissipate all that energy that comes along. So how do we currently design dams? So this is the, the typical best, best design approach. So we've got physical models. That means smaller scale uh, models of a larger scale structure that we build in the, in the lab. And we complement that ideally with numerical models. We do CFD modeling uh, and um, bridging both together in so called hybrid modeling. So that's best practice at the moment. However, there are some limitations linked with smaller scales and also missing validation data for both. Underpinned is everything from fluid mechanics concepts. So if we think about the complexity of flows, and I'm talking in particular about stilling basin complexity of flows, I will touch on the question, do we have the right instrumentation for, uh, to measure what we actually need to measure to design this in the current design approach and physical modeling? Um, I will touch on the question uh, of scale effects. So we know that air water flows cannot be scaled accurately between model and prototype. So in other words, a small bubble that I might measure in the laboratory, it's not going to be 50 times larger uh, and scaling with my length scale that I have in the ratio between my model and prototype. Yeah? So they are quite small. So we've got an issue in terms of scaling. And so we've got a lack of validation data for both physical and numerical. And so that brings to me to a question, are current design approaches sufficient for structures that should never fail? So this is the current approach. Show of hands maybe, who thinks the current approach is appropriate? Who thinks the approach is not appropriate? I'm with you, I do not know, all right? Because there are a lot of questions here around the validation, etc in terms of scale effects, et cetera, that we just do not know because we do not actually have prototype data in the first place. So this is a current approach and it has worked quite well for quite some time, but the question should be, going back to the previous question, shouldn't we do as good as we can with the available technology considering that these dams should never fail? All right, let's start with uh, what we have in terms of instrumentation and approaches. So if we've got non aerated flowers, so this is the video of, uh, of my lab in, in Sydney. So um, I'm shaking with the camera, but you see here a, a classical weir with non aerated flows. And here you can see an ADB measuring upstream. It's pretty straightforward. Once we've got non aerated flows, these type of flows, we've got a lot of, a whole range of instrumentation available from PIB to LDAs, etc. We can get flow depths very accurately. We can get uh, three-dimensional instantaneous velocity fields, etc. So we've got a pretty good understanding. We can complement this with CFD models, which can model very well under these flow conditions. We can uh, also underpin this with analytical approaches. We've got still a lack of uh, quantitative prototype data, even for non-aerated flows, to um, to bridge that. But I think non-aerated flows is pretty fine. In this video, we see non so it's a spillway. We see non aerated flow upstream. You can see there's some fluctuations, and it's from the laboratory. In the prototype, you would even see like uh, potentially large scale eddies, et cetera. But 
what I want to point out here, upstream is relatively straightforward, we can measure this, but as soon as the flow becomes aerated, the situation changes. So it's not that easy. So if we had aerated flows, we can't actually use these type of instrumentation. We can't. So ADBs, LDA, PIB, it doesn't work because we've got a lot of aeration and the device um, would not give you any meaningful results. So what do we use? Uh, I listed below here typical instrumentation that have been used and are used, face detection probes, LiDAR, cameras, ADMs, and pressure sensors. And I will in particular now focus on the first three and discuss further what the current knowledge and approach is with these. So face detection probes have been around since the 60s. Um, they're considered as the best suited instrumentation for measuring air water flows. They're intrusive. They look like this. They've got little needles which um, are positioned inside the flow, and then the air water flow uh, is pierced by these probe tips and provides information on the instantaneous air water interfaces. We use typically fiber optical probes or so called conductivity probes. This is a probe that, that I'm, I'm using or have been um, manufactured at my lab. You can see. So these are typical results we get. We've got a voltage signal here on the y-axis over time. And you see if the probe is in water, you will get a higher voltage as if the probe is in air, where the signal suddenly drops and then goes back up when the probe is in water, etc. So you get a recording of the air-water interfaces continuously and sampled typically with high frequency. So these data are then post-processed to provide some time average local properties. So at every location where this prop is positioned in the air water flow, you would get information on the local air concentrations. Furthermore, this air concentration can be used for key design parameters, for example, flow depths, flow resistance, or also um, depth average velocity. Velocity measurements, however, are not that simple. So we typically use cross collation based approaches where we have our simultaneously sample of leading and trailing tip signals and we use this cross correlation to infer our time average velocity. Um, there's a new method, uh, well, not that new, but four years ago it was proposed to have the so-called adaptive window cross collation technique which gives us uh, pseudo instantaneous velocity time series of air water flows by basically segmenting our raw signals into smaller windows and then do a cross correlation for each of those windows. So this worked quite well, it has got some limitations, but that's probably the state of art at where we are. And it's probably as far as we can go with the current instrumentation that we have. This was further explored then using this AWCC to look at um, the velocity measurements more generally to get an idea of how accurate our velocity measurements and uh, this study has shown that there is um, some deviation with what the probes would measure linked with bubble probe interactions. So what we can see here in figure B and C, when a bubble um, is pierced by the um, connectivity probe tips, the bubble deforms and also slows down and has got like an impact force. And hence, there's an underestimation of the velocities interfacial velocities. And so Hohenwood proposed like a correction scheme to account for this. The key thing here is that the larger the probe tip, the larger the probe tip, the stronger the impact interaction with the bubbles is, and the stronger the bubbles would slow down. So ideally, we would like to have uh, as small probe sizes as possible. And ideally, the flow velocities are as high as possible to minimize those errors. So that's kind of where we are with conductivity probes, and it's probably at the point where we can't develop any further unless we come up with new types of probe designs, which is possible, but that's kind of the state of the art where we deal with this. So I mentioned before that there is a lack of prototype measurements, and you can imagine how difficult it is if there's a spilling dam to actually go into the field and measure with these type of probes. Yeah, it's not easy. So we need those data, however, for um, validation of our laboratory studies and CFD models. So we must have something there. And I would like to point out here the study on Rutzonadam in 2020 done, uh, 2021, 
where we were able to measure high velocity flows in the, um, yeah, in the middle outlet of that particular dam. Here you can see on the left an array of um, probes. We had um, 16 of these probes installed at two different um, yeah, sampling times. These are the probes that I showed before from Sydney, but just basically putting the probes into the framing here, which was installed by ETH, um, led by Benjamin Wong. So during that study, you see here this, this beam with the props installed and flow coming in this direction. You can imagine this is a 45 degree angled spillway. Yeah? And the flow is moving past these props at up to 40 meters per second. Not in this video, but uh, 40 meters per second local velocities. At the end, all the props were destroyed. Some at the very beginning, etc., but some gave us some signals for at least a period of time. So results are shown here for, for a range of flow rates up to 16 cubic meters per second, which is around the 40 meters per second mark. So we got some really useful and good results at the prototype scale. And you see here, um, shown here is the void fraction distributions. And you see here the, these lines, which indicate the advective diffusion equation, which has been developed based on laboratory data. So in other words, we see exactly the same in the prototype as we see in the laboratory, which is great. Also, the velocities match what we would expect in the laboratory, looking at theory. However, this is done in the low, the Reynolds numbers, the low 10 to the power of seven. In reality, uh, spilling cases might have uh, yeah, two or three orders of magnitude higher Reynolds numbers. So this is great, but it only validates our observations up to that scale. So if we want to go to larger flows even, this is really challenging. So this study was quite challenging and going to larger scale will be even more challenging. So is remote sensing then an option? So and that's uh, another technology that I believe has got some merit. And I will focus here in particular on LiDAR sensors and cameras. And these type of sensors are readily available. Everybody knows cameras. And LIDAR is one of the key devices in our autonomous vehicles, et cetera. So it's, it's, an, it's a market which will be further evolving and developing uh, into the future. The advantage of these type of devices is that they can give continuous information and we get information about a higher spatial range and also with pretty detailed temporal resolution. The question is, can we use these type of instrumentations to improve on our ground truth data that we get from our connectivity probes. So this image here illustrates, uh, just sketches potential options, how to use these type of instruments, both in the lab, but also in the field. So we could have a fixed, mounted at a certain location, maybe downstream, depends on the perspective we wanna get, or we could operate this based on a moving drone. Yeah, so flying with a drone, it obviously depends on, on access to a dam at a, at a situation of spilling, but we've got opportunities here to use these type of technology. So this has not been used until recently, and I'm going to start with LIDAR first. So we started using LIDAR at my lab in Sydney in 2018 or 2017, we started, and then uh, went step by step through different hydraulic phenomena. So we started with hydraulic jumps, as was a pilot study. Let's see if that actually works. And we see here a hydraulic jump in the video at the top, and below we see a LIDAR, instantaneous LIDAR signal of the same, uh, not, not time synchronized, but it's, it's a comparable um, hydraulic jump situation. And what you can see is how the LIDAR is continuously giving data points at a, across the full range of the uh, hydraulic jump, with instant, almost instantaneous information. Scanning here at 35 hertz with an angular resolution of 0.25 degrees. So this is very useful because it could provide much more detail on the uh, flow fundamentals. In particular, we suddenly get at the same time the jump to move movement, so it's moving backwards and forwards as it does in a hydraulic jump, as well as the simultaneously the free surface motion. This has been missed in the past if you've got point measurements devices, which obviously only record at a certain location. And if the whole thing is moving, we are missing quite a bit of information. 
This then brought us to use it also in the design of applied research. So I'm not going to go in detail here because it's, uh, this was a commercial project as well, but it's basically um, has been then explored by one of my PhD students to look closer at potentials to use in um, stilling basin design more generally. So you can imagine that you get at each location where you put a LIDAR, you get such an instantaneous observation of your pre-surface. And you can get a map, you can actually map across, you can record at any location. And this can actually give you really useful information about uh, where to put your buffer blocks or how to move them backwards and forwards, because you can see small changes in your free surface or you see small changes in the stability of your jump tool that you can utilize in improving your design of a still method. And last, uh, another phenomenon here again, um, this is our large spillway model in my lab. It's about nine meters long and we get floweration at some distance along here. The LIDAR is positioned here and spins continuously measuring the air water flows along the spillway. We can see a few feature here. Upstream, this is a non aerated flower region. The LIDAR cannot pick up anything meaningful. So it basically shines through the water and doesn't pick up anything meaningful. So no signal, meaningful signal is returned. In the air water flow, we get this return that you can see here. And you can see like waves propagating through. It's indeed what we have on spillways. There are waves as well, in addition to our air water flows, which are consistently. Um, there. So that obviously brought us to the next question, can we use LIDAR in the field? And uh, so the first study we did was looking at gauging flows at a low head wheel. Um, we had already lined up to do some tests at a large dam, however COVID hit and uh, we were not allowed to leave Sydney at that time, etc. So we, we made use of a local wheel, which is just outside of WIL, when there was a sudden uh, overtopping event. And we recorded continuously for several hours, picking up the change in water elevation upstream of this wheel. And so you can see quite nicely the instantaneous LIDAR signal, as well as a, a smooth data series, which collapses very well with piezometric pressure measurements that are conducted by the government agency MHL. So we could actually measure uh, the surface continuously. Interesting here is this is clear water flows. In the laboratory, we could not measure anything meaningful in clear water. However, in the field, we could measure very well this type of flow because it's more muddy, murky, there's more particles in, etc. So it's actually worked quite well. And then another aspect of uh, going into the field was measuring uh, river rapids. Again, similar opportunistic case looking at um, yeah, this river rapids further downstream of this creek, recording again instantaneous data. This one is across here where there's a large rock underneath, where, which caused like hydraulic jump formation. So that's where we are, but there's continuing research at the moment, and uh, I'm not going to present on those, but aim is basically to test this as, as very large structures to validate this in the field to see if we can actually get uh, reliable remote sensing data of lines. So I want to touch on the second aspect and looking here at camera technology. So we've got side view applications uh, which have been used for quite some time, uh, including bubble image velocimetry and optical flow methods, where people look through the side, uh, side view of rooms. They have got a key limitation. They are obviously, you've got the sidewall boundary layer and sidewall effects, and you also have a limitation that this is only based on laboratory data. So top view applications are the next promising option, and it has gathered some interest in recent years. So there's been a stereoscopic camera use in hydraulic jump, a LiDAR camera used in a stilling basin design, and here I want to touch on high-speed camera used on top view, looking for being able to record inception points, but in particular, also free surface velocities and free surface uh, fluctuations. So there's potential to use camera technology in the laboratory to measure the uh, velocity field close to the surface of the rate of flows. 
If you look at prototype application of cameras, it's an obvious case that there is enormous potential. Uh, if you search on YouTube or somewhere else and you find, uh, you will find a lot of images, camera recordings of spilling dams everywhere. So people have done that for quite some time. It's readily available, but people have not looked at quantitative recordings. So very often you validate the physical model or the American model against like some images you might have picked up during a flood, but never really trying to link it with quantitative data. So let's look at this pilot study here, which um, used the drone measurements that uh, 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 citizen scientists have done of Hintze Dam in Australia, spilling dam. And so we used that to analyze this video data with the same method as you could see in the previous figure to look at, can we extract meaningful results at prototype scale? And um, first it was able to record automatically the inception point of resurface aeration. And also we were able to get velocities in streamwise direction, okay? And so this is uh, an important step because theoretically we can measure resurface velocities, which we can link with the underlying flow profile and what we know from the laboratory in terms of flow resistance and potentially use that to gather important data in the field. So this is really promising opportunity um, that has been by other researchers as well, or other researchers starting to explore this as well. So now I'm doing a bit of a shift because I promised in my abstract I would also talk about the Lagrangian sensor which uh, I will have only one slide on this. So people have done quite a bit of uh, gathering on information about fish safety and health, health, not so much from the hydraulics community, but more from the fish community, fish biology background. And they use these type of sensors. So this is a sensor we built at, at my lab in Sydney. So these are little sensors that you can throw in the water and they record pressures and accelerations or even other properties as they move through a structure. Yeah. Um, here's a video, you see that now coming through very quickly, you could see this blue thing of some ongoing research of one of my PhD students where we look more at fish injury in close conduit systems. But it's the same thing, we can actually get instantaneous information about pressures and accelerations. So this is acceleration at the entrance, you see it goes up to 25G and pressure drops as well at the entrance. So while I am bringing it into this presentation, there's actually uh, both for the field and the prototype, there are actually opportunities to use Lagrangian type sensors in large scale hydraulic structures, which has not been done on hydraulics. All right, so in conclusion, I had three questions um, that I tried to answer and I, I'm gonna bring it together here. So first we've got complex flows. Do we have the right instrumentation for, to measure what we need to measure? And just as a comment here, sometimes we don't need to measure all the complexities that are there. We might just be interested in the flow depths to do a design. So it's not always, we don't need to measure what we can measure, what we need to measure. So in terms of uh, inter internal air water flows, we've got the phase detection props. They provide really a ground truth signal of, of the air water flows. However, these props are limited to streamwise direction and a single point only. And in particular, the stilling basin, where we've got three dimensional flow motions, these sensors get to the limitation. So it's really a big limitation. So, LiDAR and camera can potentially provide additional information, um, more time resolved and spatially resolved. However, that's obviously only an envelope property. We could also have pressure sensors from underneath. It's also an envelope property. So we need to think further if we can combine these sensors and validation further to improve our instrumentation for our physical problem. What about prototype measurements? that are desperately needed for validation of both um, numerical and physical modeling. So it's really challenging to do that with phase detection props. It is challenging. So the question is, can we use LiDAR and cameras for this instead? So quantitative prototype observations with, with these devices. Um, 
I believe yes. However, there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done. So we need to cross validate, cross compare with the face detection probes at large scale, so that we can actually say what their measure is comparative to the ground truth. We can use some um, obviously theoretical models, etc., to strengthen this, but there needs to be some cross validation. If it's cross validated, there's a new opportunity as well. It could be combined with the um, yeah, decision support system, for example, Oracle Dam. When the when the spillway failed, you would have a decision support system. The camera would pick up immediately something is wrong. So you could have an instantaneous information of something is going wrong. For example, along the spillway. So I asked the question before: Are current design approaches sufficient for structures that should never fail? I still do not do not know the answer, but I still propose that we have an opportunity to improve our current design approaches by bringing in quantitative prototype observations. They could validate everything we do. And um, I leave it up to here if we should do that or not, or where we get to, or if we ever get to this. But uh, just um, thanks very much.